Welcome, everyone. Tonight, I'm Kat Quinna. I'm the Associate Dean here. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome you to our URI Feinstein Providence campus, where we have been offering quality education for over 70 years to non-traditional students, as well as holding a strong commitment to the urban mission of the university. We have an ongoing urban initiative, and out of that, has grown this idea of an urbanscape year. It came from a discussion about ways that we could, quote, take our urban initiative public. That is, to bring together campus and community to celebrate urban life and to explore solutions to the urban challenges facing us. And this whole year long program, there's a, there's a flyer out there that will, or a sheet out there that tells you the fall schedule. We're offering arts and culture exhibits a new urban studies academic program, public lectures and community forums, conversation hours, and fun explorations of the city. We'll hope you participate with us, sharing your ideas, your wisdom, and of course your enthusiasm. Briefly, I want to thank the, organizer of the organizers of the Year of the Urbanscape, faculty members Marshall Feldman, Paul Florin, who's in Vietnam, I believe, at the moment, setting up some wonderful programs. And Ann Hubbard, where's, I don't see Ann, can't see in this, yeah. Um, Arts and Culture Coordinator Stephen Pennell, URI Providence staff members Amy Foltz and Joanne DeBello, our student and recent graduate Tiffany Edward, who I don't believe here, is here yet, Community member Mark Levitt, who you'll see much more of later, and especially our Urban Initiative Coordinator, Tammy Vargas Warner, who's also responsible for getting that great food here tonight. Thank you, Tammy. I'd like to start by introducing you to our Vice Provost for Urban Affairs, Dr. John McRae, who will provide a welcome from the university. Thank you, Dr. Quinna. It's in my job description to do welcomes. Welcome. <laughs> no, not quite like that. I really, we're going to have a fun night tonight. And I want to welcome you all to the Urbanscape Project, which will specifically examine the opportunities and challenges of urban life in Rhode Island. We are truly grateful for the support from the university and its recognition that research into problems and the development of urban communities hold the key for the advancement both economically and socially for most of this state and human society. We also are thankful to have the support of two outstanding urban administrators in Mr. Kevin Flynn, who I'll introduce in a minute, and Mr. Mark Livett, and the presence of one who arguably is the best urban eco economist in the country, and our guest speaker who will be introduced to you shortly. Clearly, in the competition for resources, we need all of the support that you can give our students and researchers here at the University of Rhode Island's urban campus. I would also thank all of you who came uh, out here on a Monday night. This is football night, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> and I'm sure that, don't remind you, is that what he said? Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're not watching that anymore. <laughs> well, the Pats played yesterday, so. <laughs> and I'm sure that you will find that the investment in time, however, will be well rewarded. I would also like to express our appreciation for the Urban Scape Planning Committee, as already named, that made this program possible, and the work that they had done in soliciting the university for its support. It is my pleasure this time to introduce you to Mr. Kevin Flynn. Dr. Uh, Mr. Flynn has been the Associate Director of the State of Rhode Island's Division of Planning since September of 2005. Prior to that, he had served as the Director of Planning for the City of Cranston since 1985. He has also served as an adjunct faculty member on the University of Rhode Island Department of Community Planning from 1989 to 2003. 
He serves as staff to the State Planning uh, Council and is a member of the Housing Resources Commission. He is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts. We do not hold that against him. <laughs> and he is a graduate of the University of Rhode Island. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Dr. McCray. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, um, uh, particularly to be part of such a, a prestigious presentation, which I, I know we're going to be hear, hearing shortly. Uh, I've asked, been asked to say a few words on behalf of the professional planning community, and I'm honored to do so, particularly with some discussion about the importance of cities. Uh, the health of our cities is a major uh, theme of our state's land use plan, and our, our land use policy, and it's vital for our future. Uh, obviously, we're sitting in the state's uh, capital city right now, and as you look around this place, you see the changes, those of you who are familiar with the city, you see the changes on our doorsteps, um, very different from what you would have found here even as recently as 10 years ago, particularly on Westminster Street. Uh, that is due in large part to taxation programs such as the historic tax credit, uh, which unfortunately is no longer in its existence. Hopefully it will come back in some form. Uh, and the state's efforts through that program to inspire redevelopment of the urban core, and it was probably the most successful program the state has ever had uh, in doing that. Ten years ago on Westminster Street, if you were walking on it, uh, you were, might have been the only person walking on it at 8 o'clock at night. But look at it today. Uh, people living upstairs and those old uh, uh, department store buildings that um, were frankly so far off the map in terms of real estate interests that they weren't even worth tearing down. Uh, and now they've been beautifully restored. The crummy uh, retail storefronts that used to be there, if they were open at all, have all been, almost all been replaced with uh, places of life and activity and restaurants. It is a major, major change uh, as we've brought more people back to living downtown, and this is a growing trend, obviously, in our society in general. Uh, you probably saw the um, story in the Sunday paper about the vibrancy of our arts community. Uh, very, you don't get that in the suburbs. You only get that in places uh, like a, a city like Providence. And frankly, what we have to offer here in Rhode Island uh, belies our relatively small size. We have a tremendous wealth of uh, arts, uh, restaurant and other activities uh, in our downtown. But one thing I think that's important, uh, one of our great appeals as a state is the proximity of our urban areas to other aspects of the state that we value, which is our rural quality of life. Um, in Rhode Island, in, in Providence, you can leave the city by car, not at rush hour maybe, but uh, at most times, and within 15 minutes be uh, in a rural country environment, whether if you go east to Rehoboth, Massachusetts, or west to the town of Situate. Uh, I've done it. I've uh, had staff people who argued that you couldn't do it in 15 minutes, and I proved them wrong, and I, I obeyed the speed limit, too. So, um, And that's another theme of our state land use policy, is to um, treasure the diversity and the distinction between our urban and our rural places. Uh, and they are really one of the great assets of the state. You can't get that in a city the size of Boston. You might be able to get it in a Worcester or a Springfield, but let's face it, we are way cooler than Worcester or Springfield. Um, within our urban places, we, we have so much to value. It is part of our sense of place. It is part of what makes Rhode Island uh, unique and different. Our cities don't look like any, like any place USA. They, are, they have their own character. Uh, they have a richness of history, culture, arts, and commerce. In short, they are centers of life and living. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, look forward to hearing Dr. Glaze's comments and greatly appreciate the invitation to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you both. When we began planning this year, my colleague Paul Florin said, you have to involve Mark Levitt. We are so happy we did. Mark brings a special understanding of the issues that face cities today, 
along with a global perspective and the ability to bring it all home into the local perspective, and a network of contacts that boggles the typical address book. He has been a wonderful presence in our meetings, bringing humor and wisdom to the process of planning, which sometimes isn't all that fun. Mark is a writer, storyteller, audio artist, and the host and co-executive producer of the NEH-funded, WGBH-hosted, and nationally distributed talk, uh, radio show, Action Speaks, underappreciated 20th century dates that changed America. And there is a card out there about his program. It's wonderful. Mr. Levitt's work lives at the intersection of the arts, humanities, and education. He has facilitated discussions on television, radio, and in person. His educational consultancy takes him to, has taken him to over 50 countries and to all continents except Australia and Antarctica. You've got to solve at least one of those. We promise you will see more of him this year as well. And as I noted, there's a full fall schedule out there. We'll have two more community forums with speakers from all over the country discussing urban issues. Mark? Okay, that, thank you. Was that me? No, no. no, I didn't mean messing up. I mean who you introduced. That was lovely. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that, Kat. And I really appreciate, first of all, you people for being here, uh, especially on a Monday night. It's a wonderful, wonderful audience. And those people who came out and responded to our... Uh, our advertising, our publicity, I really, really appreciate it. Um, yes, I was brought in to help uh, organize and moderate uh, this uh, three week, three, three times and maybe five times forum, and it's been an honor to be involved with all those who have uh, participated in the creation of this forum. Nothing like this is easy, but one thing that was easy was calling up Ed Glazer. I have uh, known about Ed Glazer's work, I read his book, and I thought calling him up and inviting him here would be a daunting task. I would be on the phone with a Harvard economist, a man whose work is known uh, throughout the world, and uh, you know, I would have to all of a sudden put on my deep voice and pretend I was important. But I actually uh, called him and we hit it off right away. And it was a pleasure to begin a relationship which I'm sure will continue beyond even uh, this event today. He's so humble that he looked at my introduction to him and he said, that's too much. So Ed, I want to ask you, what should I take out here? I... Do you want the middle name in here at all? Okay, get rid of the middle name, I got that. And where well, you went to elementary school, you don't want that? Okay, and you said, what teams? Oh, you did, said you were on no teams, that's right, so I won't put that on. And, uh, all right, I think I got it. Thank you. Anyway, what we're going to do is this. Ed's going to talk for about 35 minutes, and then he and I are going to get a chair each, and we're going to sit up there, and we're going to talk for a little bit back and forth, and then we'll give you a chance to ask some questions as well. Sound good? All right. Uh, Ed Glazer, he's an American economist and the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University. He's the director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and the director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston, both at the Kennedy School of, uh, both at the Kennedy School of Government. He was also an editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics. His book entitled Triumph uh, of the City, How Our Greatest Invention Makes Us Richer, Smarter, Greener, Healthier, and Happier, was published in 2011. It summarizes its years of research into the role that cities play in fostering human achievement. It's my great pleasure, and I am honored to be able to introduce Ed Glazer to you and uh, honored that he decided to come here on one phone call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that very kind introduction. And I am I'm thrilled to be here and really terribly grateful uh, that all of you chose to come out here tonight. Uh, this was an easy sell to me because the whole idea of this, this urban project is just thrilling. And I'm really couldn't be more excited uh, that the University of Rhode Island is doing this. And I am... Um, I could not be more excited to be here. I, uh, I brought my kids down here about a year ago and, and was just stunned by the transformation in this neighborhood. And I really think it is absolutely remarkable. It's a lot to be proud of. Um, and delighted to be, uh, even, in, even just for a night, uh, here part of it. Let's see if... Um, 
So I start with this picture, and then I move immediately to this one, because I'm trying to highlight right from the start my utter lack of aesthetic sense by comparing uh, the first one with the second. Um, and I, I, just to make it even more obvious, I insist on calling this a portrait of America. Um, now, it's a portrait in the sense that what this ugly figure does is it splits the 3,000 odd counties in the United States into tenths, 300 odd counties in each one of those little dots. And I have sorted those tenths of counties uh, on the basis of their density, from the least dense along your left-hand side to the most dense along your right-hand side. Because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are proximity, closeness, density. What you see here uh, in the blue line is the relationship between income and population density across America. The most dense tenth of America's counties have incomes that are on average 50 percent higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is a general phenomenon, the tendency of proximity to enable our economic potential that has shown up in hundreds if not thousands of studies in every part of the globe. Um, the three largest metropolitan areas in the United States, uh, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, produce 18 percent of America's gross domestic product, while including only 13 percent of America's population. And if America as a whole saw its per capita productivity levels rise to those seen in the New York metropolitan area, our national GDP would go up by 43 percent. Now, the top line shows something I, th I find even more remarkable. It shows the relationship between density as of the year 2000 and population growth between 2000 and 2010. And what you can see from this graph is that the more dense the area was initially, the faster the population growth over the past 10 years. Whereas at the start of the 19th century, we were leaving our dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces in the American hinterland, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're clustering in. Now, accompanying this economic productivity and uh, population growth is a rise in housing prices. And this looks within metropolitan areas at housing price growth between 2001 and 2008, the latest year for which such data is available, and miles from the city center. And as you can see, price growth over this period was about 50 percent higher in the close-in neighborhoods relative to the areas that are further out. The, and indeed, every piece of evidence we have suggests that the, while there's been, of course, substantial housing price corrections, and I'll return to that later, those price corrections have been more severe on the city's edge than they have been at the city, at the city center. Now, the growth of our cities, the success of America's cities, um, which of course is not universal across those cities, but is a general trend, is a worldwide phenomenon. It's true in London, it's true in Paris, it's true in San Francisco, it's true in Tokyo, it's true in Singapore. But these are all wealthy cities, and the things that are happening in those wealthy cities are dwarfed by what is happening in the developing cities of the world, in the great communities of Mumbai and Kolkata and uh, Shenzhen and in sub-Saharan Africa, places where cities are transforming countries that have lived for thousands of years in rural poverty, transforming them into places that are connected with the outside world, that are participating in tremendous social, political, and cultural change. Gandhi famously said, the growth of the nation depends not on cities, but on its villages. But with all due respect to the great man, on this one, he was completely and utterly wrong. Because, in fact, the future of India and the growth of India does not depend on rural India, which is changing very, very slowly, tragically so. The growth of India is happening in Bangalore. The growth of India is happening in Gurgaon. The growth of, happening, of India is happening in Delhi. It's happening in cities that are doing what cities have been doing for thousands of years, of enabling humanity to become stronger, more productive, more interesting, by connecting with other human beings. For at their heart, cities are not structures, as lovely as these structures outside us may be. Cities are flesh and blood. They are human beings, and those structures only matter if they connect us with each other and enable us to learn from one another. You know, we've just passed this incredible halfway point where more than half of humanity now lives in urban areas. And it's hard not to think that on net that's a good thing. Because when you compare those countries that are more urbanized to those countries that more than 50% are urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% are urbanized, the more urbanized countries have on average income levels that are, are five times higher and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. It is easy amidst the muck of, of and difficulties of many of the developing world cities 
to just think, oh, wouldn't it be better if they lived in charming rural communities, you know, like in a George Eliot novel or something. Um, but of course, anyone who has this vision that rural life is so charming hasn't been to rural India any time lately. Right? Rural communities, the rural parts of the poor world, are not charming little backwaters where the country parson rolls by in a, in a, from one well-fed household to the other. They're places of poverty. They're places of despair. They're places of stasis. One thing that you notice is that one, one way to, to see this is to actually look at how happy people say that they are. Across the U.S., there's no tendency of people who live in big cities to say that they're happier than people who live in rural areas. After all, what self-respecting New Yorker, and this one's for you, Mark, is going to answer to some survey that he's really happy? I mean, I mean it just sounds so implausible, right? Um, get lost would be the more natural response. Uh, but, but in the developing world, people who live in cities do say that they are significantly more satisfied with their lives than people who live in rural areas. And this shows across the countries of the world, ranking them by the degree of urbanization, self-reported life satisfaction. And as you can see, there's a very strong tendency of people who live in more urbanized countries, and this is true even holding income constant, for them to say that they are more happy uh, with their lives. Um, now, in some sense, this success of cities is something of a paradox. We live in an age in which it is effortless to telecommute in from whatever sylvan spot appeals to your biophilia. We could all, throughout the planet, just go to some grassy knoll and, di and dial it in, enjoying the, the birds and the deer and whatnot. Um, and yet in so many ways, in so many places, we don't choose that outcome. We choose to put up with the inconveniences of the city life despite the internet, despite email, despite all of these electronic means of communication. 25 years ago, the cyber seers and the techno-prophets were predicting that all these forms of new technology would make cities obsolete, that we would just live in low-density electronic cottages and just, just dial it in. But that didn't happen at all, despite the fact that distance is apparently dead and that we live in a flat world. Cities, whether or not they are Boston or Bangalore, uh, are more vital and important than ever. Now, and I'll return to that paradox later, now, this relatively rosy picture of cities, uh, I think I can make it with a fairly straight face, and indeed I'll try and make a compelling case for it throughout the talk, but I, I think I would have had a lot of trouble m making similar statements in, when I was a kid in New York growing up. And these are two iconic images of New York history from the 1970s. I was born in 67 in New York. The bottom image, which is uh, mildly uh, covered by the, by the chair, shows this... Um, famous picture of Gerald Ford and the headline, Ford to City, Drop Dead. Now, Ford didn't actually tell New York to drop dead. He, those lines never came out of his mouth. But a lot of people think he really didn't mean it. And indeed, during those years, it didn't just seem like Ford. It seemed like history itself was telling all of our older, colder histories that they were relics headed for the trash heap of history. New York had been shedding manufacturing jobs by the tens and hundreds of thousands in the 1960s, accompanying this deindustrialization, the exodus of the formerly great garment sector was social distress, vast increases in crime rates, riots that afflicted many of our older, colder cities, and fiscal mismanagement. Ford was, telling, uh, Ford was refusing the city's request for a bailout, not unreasonably so, given how New York had mismanaged its finances in the 60s and, and 1970s. The top image shows Ford's successor, Jimmy Carter, wandering through the wasteland of the South Bronx when it seemed as if it was really possible that the age of the city was gone, that indeed our cities would revert back to some you know, pastoral, rural, nature-controlled uh, uh, existence, sort of like Planet of the Apes, you know, where the, 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 the Statue of Liberty comes poking up out of the sand, right? And uh, this is really what the South Bronx is starting to look like here, that it looks as if the weeds are taking over a once thriving uh, urban neighborhood. In some sense, the decline of cities... At the, in the 1970s seemed so inexorable because it was clear that the economic forces that had once cost cities, whether they are Providence or Boston or New York or Chicago, the economic forces that had caused them to come about, that had caused them to explode in the 19th and early 20th centuries, those economic forces had disappeared. If you think about all of our older, colder cities, they are fundamentally where they are because they were part of solving a transportation problem. At the start of the 19th century, Americans sat on the edge of an incredibly wealthy hinterland that was virtually inaccessible. Right? A, a hinterland that was full of rich farmland, great mines, coal, 
uh, iron ores, gold off in California, but it cost as much to ship goods 30 miles over land as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. It was that difficult to get into the interior of this country. And so we sat perched on the Atlantic seaboard, clinging to our watery lifeline. Over the course of the 19th century, we built this amazing transportation infrastructure. We built this incredible network, first the canals, the Erie Canal, the Illinois and Michigan Canal, and then railroads that supplemented those canals. And cities grew up on pinch points of that system. Every one of the 20 largest cities in 1900 in the United States was built on a major waterway from the oldest, typically where the river meets the sea, like Providence or New York or Boston, or to the newest, Minneapolis, on the northernmost navigable point on the Mississippi River system. And industry grew up around their transportation advantages. If you think about Chicago, and this is, of course, an image of Chicago, Chicago is a city that was bound to grow. It was the linchpin of a great watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans. The Illinois and Michigan Canal connected the Chicago River with the Mississippi River system. And that, of course, was, uh, sorry, connected uh, the Chicago River with the Mississippi River system. And through the Chicago River, it was connected to the Great Lakes, which had in turn been connected to the Hudson River by the Erie Canal, an arc spanning all the way from New York to New Orleans. And, of course, at pinch points, be they Buffalo, the western terminus of the, of the Erie Canal, or Chicago, industry formed on those pinch points of the, of the great system. That was always the case. Our industries have already always located around these transportation uh, centers. New York's three greatest industries in the 19th century were sugar refining, printing and publishing, and the garment trade. They were all children of the port. The garment trade was there, of course, because there were a lot of textiles coming in and out of New York, and there was plenty of demand for ready-made goods, whether from sailors or from customers in the South. That's a euphemism for slaves, who were many of the early, earliest recipients of ready-made clothes in, uh, in New York. Sugar refining was there because of the tremendous trade with the Caribbean. And of course, you can't refine sugar down at the point of, uh, that you're growing the crops in the 19th centuries, because refined sugar crystals would coalesce during a long, hot sea voyage north. So you had to refine them sh close to the point of production. But you wanted to refine them in a, in a city where you could take advantage of the large urban markets. And so great urban entrepreneurs like Isaac Roosevelt, who is not, as you may have heard in Mad Men, a farmer, uh, Isaac Roosevelt, who got their start, uh, and this was the family fortune that eventually put FDR in the White House, as a sugar refiner great urban, urban industrialist. And of course, New York then had printing and publishing, also the child of the port, because the big money in 19th century printing and publishing was in pirated English novels. Right? No you know, uh, LDC thief of American property rights had anything on our boys in the 1820s. Uh, and of course, the big thing is if you're not going to have any copyright for your book, you better publish first, right? There's no percentage in having the eighth pirated edition of Girl with a Dragon Tattoo floating on. So, you know, this gave a huge advantage to being in America's best port because the pirated novels, the latest Sir Walter Scott novel, Peveril of the Peak, makes it to New York days before it even shows up in Philadelphia. So the Harper brothers can flood the market with their copies of this thing days before their Philadelphia competitors carry and even get the thing. Now, Chicago... Chicago's great industry, largest by value added, second by employment, is the stockyards, right? Famous Chicago industry, and this is, in, this is, of course, an image of them, right next to the train stops, right? Part of that transportation network. And, of course, the stockyards are part of making corn and grain valuable. America, then as now, is great at growing corn, right? Even without utterly benighted Department of Agricultural Policy supporting corn, uh, that was a completely unnecessary editorial side, forgive me. Uh, even behind whatever, whatever government policies, wise or foolish, we may follow, we're good at growing corn in this country, right? We are endowed uh, uh, with tremendous, tremendous cropland for this. The big problem was always how to move that corn. In the earliest days, we moved it by transforming it into that very portable and potable and tasty product of whiskey, right? A very condensed way of moving corn over space. And then we moved to salted pork which travels quite well. And for some reason, humans have always, or at least in, our, in, in the West, have tended to prefer salted pork over salted beef. But then, when Armour figures out, and that's why his name is up there, when Armour figures out about refrigerated rail cars, okay, you can slaughter the beef in Chicago and then ship it east. The big innovation with the refrigerated rail cars where you put the blocks of ice on top so the cold water drips down instead of below the dressed sides of beef. Great industry grows, grows up around that. Now, the remarkable thing 
about cities, of course, is even when they form for utterly prosaic reasons, I mean, everything that I've been telling you makes it sound as if cities are are part of solving an operations research problem, right? You put the city there because you minimize the cost of production, and all that's true. But the magic of cities is even when they form for completely prosaic reasons, when smart people come together in an urban area, miracles happen. It has always been so. It was that way when Plato and Socrates bickered on an Athenian street corner 2,500 years ago, or when a city built on wool and banking gave us a pictorial renaissance in Florence six centuries ago. Now, these bursts, which occur in very localized, these bursts of creativity, these bursts of genius that occur in very localized areas, often come about because of chains of genius. One smart person figures out an idea and then passes it along to the next who improves it and so forth. So, in Florence, Brunelleschi figures the basic mathematics of linear perspective, passes it along to, to his friend Donatello, who puts it in low relief sculpture. Think of the, the sculpture below uh, St. George on the wall of Orson Michele in, in Florence, passes it along to Masaccio who puts it in three dimensions, a large painting showing depth with real space involved in it, that marvelous image of, of St. Peter finding a, a fish in the belly, uh, finding a coin in the belly of a fish, Pass, who, who passes it along to his friend, that less than saintly monk, Fra Filippo Lippi, passes it along to Botticelli and so forth, a chain of genius, each person riffing on each other's ideas. And so it was in Chicago in the 1870s and 1880s, a city that was rebuilding itself in the, great, in the wake of a fire, and there, the great innovation was the skyscraper, a combination of steel and, and a transportation uh, method, the elevator, that enabled us to transform our cities. What you're looking at here is the Chicago Home Insurance Building, widely considered to be the first skyscraper. Its architect, William LeBaron Jenny, is often called the father of the skyscraper. But, of course, there is a lively architectural history debate about whether or not Jenny deserves this title or whether or not this is indeed the first skyscraper. There's always a lively architectural deb history debate about everything good. Um, and indeed, there's a right to be a debate. It's not a proper skyscraper. Skyscraper being defined as a relatively tall, tall building with a load-bearing steel or cast iron skeleton. Right? This was certainly not the tallest building of its time, even St. Pancras in London is higher than this, but St. Pancras has walls like a medieval fortress that, uh, that bear its weight. This, the front two walls do indeed have a steel skeleton, but not the back walls. They're traditional masonry walls. And indeed, there were industrial buildings, going back earlier than this, that had load-bearing cast iron skeletons, and there were plenty of architects who had this idea about the same time. And so there's a debate. Is it Jenny? Is it Sullivan? Is it Root? Is it Adler? And the number of claimants to this title is, is legion. But the search for any one father of the skyscraper, just like the search for any one father of Facebook or father of any particular innovation that's really worth anything in the world, is a little bit foolish. Because the skyscraper, like pretty much everything our species has ever done that's worth anything, was a collaborative invention. It involves smart people learning from one another, borrowing each other's ideas, together building something great. And of course, you know, Burnham and Sullivan were both apprentices in Jenny's office. They all know each, knew each other well. They all borrowed each other's ideas. They all riffed on each other's innovation. One after the other, they built new buildings, each one pushing the possibilities for this new style of building. And together, they created the skyscraper. That's what cities do. That's why they're important. They enable us to learn from one another and collaboratively do stuff we could never, ever do on our own. Now, a similar chain of genius was happening not far away in Detroit 10 years later. Detroit, Detroit, the Straits, a great inland port, and of course it attracted in firms like Detroit Dry Dock. That's an image that you see on your, uh, on your left. Cutting edge companies specializing in building ships that plied the Great Lakes, and of course providing training, skills, expertise, and engine works to people like this character. Farm boy, Henry Ford, comes to Detroit, learns how to work with engines at Detroit Dry Dock. Ford then goes on to work for Thomas Alva Edison and then joins the great American race of the 1890s to try and build a mass-produced car. Now, of course, it's the Germans who actually invented the usable internal combustion engine and put together the basics of motor vehicle production. But Americans made those cars cheap. And Ford didn't do it on his own. There was a cluster of genius in Detroit in the 1890s, kind of like Silicon Valley in the 1960s. Um, all of whom knew each other, all of whom borrowed each other's ideas. It was the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, David Dunbar, Buick, Billy Durant, Ransom E. Olds. The first guy to build a car in Detroit is a guy called Charles Kirby. And according to legend, Ford followed Kirby as he drove his car along the streets of Detroit in a bicycle, trying desperately to figure out how this car worked. I don't know if this story is true, but I love it, because it gives the image of cities transmitting knowledge so purely. Um, 
And the amazing thing is together they did it. Together they figured out how to make cars cheap and affordable. None of them did it on their own. They all helped each other enormously. Um, but they created the mass-produced car. The problem was, of course, that this is how they did it. This is the Rouge, the, the vast vertically integrated plant which Ford used to produce thousand upon thousand of black Model T. In the short run, the Rouge is a marvel of productivity, right? an unbelievable efficient delivery source for creating mass-produced cars. In the long run, it's a recipe for urban disaster. Because successful cities in the 19th century, just like successful cities today, are marked by three things. Smart people, small firms, and connections to the outside world. How far from that is the Rouge, a vast vertically integrated plant walled off from the outside world, employing, employing tens of thousands of Americans with very little formal education. On one level, this is a triumph. The cheap cars are a triumph. The high wages are a triumph. This is a fantastic thing that Ford did in many ways. On the other hand, this is a terrible model for urban regeneration, because this factory doesn't need the city. It doesn't take from the city. It doesn't give to the city. It's just a thing unto itself. And when cost conditions change, as they always do, you just move the factory someplace else where it's cheaper to do business. And that's exactly what happened over the course of the 20th century. At the start of the 20th century, moving goods was expensive. This shows the change in the cost of moving a ton a mile by rail over the 20th century. 90% decline one-tenth of what it was 100 years ago. So in 1900, it made sense to put your car factory in Detroit, which had access to all of those great forms of, of watery and then rail transportation. By 1960, that stuff was irrelevant. And so you moved your factory first to the suburbs, then to right-to-work states that were more pro-business in the American South. And then, of course, you moved it to cheaper locales throughout the world. All of those older manufacturing cities were hit enormously by decline as a result of this. All of those factories followed the cost uh, imperative of moving to cheaper locale, locales. One of the things that happened with this declining transportation cost is that people built cities, people moved to cities that were defined as places where they wanted to live instead of as places where firms had an innate advantage because of some natural resource. Because of these declining transportation costs, you no longer needed to be near the coal mines. You no longer needed to be near the Great Lakes. You could be in a, a different place. And apparently the thing that Americans really wanted was warmer winters. Because there's no variable that explains population growth across the 20th century better than January temperature. And indeed, this is the relationship over the past 10 years between average population growth and average January temperature. Now, that's rolling a lot of things up into it. Warmer states did often have the advantage from a pure growth perspective of having relatively more pro-business policies. They often had the advantage of having relatively pro-building policies, which have made a huge difference over the last 30 years. So that's being rolled up in that. But make no mistake, a lot of the early settlers in places like Los Angeles were just there for the weather. Uh, and that's something that our region still fights with. Now, along with the move to sun was the move to sprawl. We have always built our urban spaces around the transportation technology that was dominant in the era in which they were created. Our oldest urban spaces, be they the downtown of New York or the inner core of, of London or uh, the area around Beacon Hill, very narrow streets, very short blocks, right? The streets often wind. Those are pedestrian spaces built around people and perhaps pack animals for moving things around. Then we have streets that are gridded, that are th where those grids make it easier to move wheeled transportation around. The omnibuses of the 1820s and 1830s. Um, then, of course, we have streetcar suburbs. We have longer lane suburbs that are made possible by things like the Philadelphia Main Line. And, of course, when the car came around, we rebuilt our urban spaces around the car. The top image is Levittown, an earlier mass-produced suburb, still a mixed suburb since people were still taking public transit. And then down here you have the woodlands, far away from Houston, but still part of the greater Houston ecosystem, uh, a vast, uh, very successful exurb built almost entirely around, around the car. Now, it's not surprising that we did this. Average commute by car in this country is 24 minutes. The average commute by public transportation is 48 minutes. But of course, this didn't happen just by a straight technological comparison. The automobile was very highly favored, as indeed it continues to be favored, by mistaken policies that, that artificially in, inflate the use of the car. The work of Nathaniel Snow at Brown University uh, examines the development of the highway system after World War uh, II and finds that each new highway that cut into an urban core reduced the central city's population by 18% relative to the rest of the metropolitan area. And we are still in the latest highway bill following the policy of subsidizing our highways, not with gas taxes, but with general tax revenues, right, which pushes very hard against a very well-known economic principle over the past 230 years that users should pay for infrastructure. 
and, and it's very hard to see why we would ever want to particularly bribe someone to drive. And I say this as someone who took my car down here and gets on the highway every day to get to work. There's no reason not to pay for that with various forms of user charges. Now hit with the move to sudden sprawl, all of our older, colder cities declined. Um, at one point or another. These were the 10 largest cities in the United States in 1950. Eight out of these 10 have at least 23% less population six years later. Three of them are less than half of their former size, Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis. Only two of them, New York, which has managed to steadfastly defy the odds, um, it has grown, and of course, Los Angeles, which is a totally different model. Along with this deindustrialization came social distress that I alluded to earlier. This is an image of Detroit in fire during the 1967 riot, when it seemed that civilization, which itself had been created by our cities, had fled to some other, uh, some other locale. And of course, the actions of the federal government weren't necessarily all that helpful. The hallmark of declining cities is that they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of demand. Detroit was built for 1.85 million people. It is less than half that now. Um, more than 90% of the homes in Central City, Detroit, are valued at less than, less than their construction costs. It never made sense to subsidize building new homes in Detroit. And yes, this is exactly what our Potemkin Village strategy of valuing cities as structures rather than cities as people was there to do in the 1950s and 1960s with urban renewal policies. And then in, after the Federal Highway Aid Act of 1973, we gave Detroit a monorail because that's what Detroit really needed was a monorail to run a circular pattern over essentially empty streets. It's easy to get around Detroit. They got a lot of roads there. Okay, the last thing you needed to do was to spend hundreds of millions of dollars putting a, a Disney-like thing above. And it's, what makes this tragic, of course, is that, that money could have been spent on Detroit's children. It could have been spent on education. It could have been spent on safety. It could have been spent on things that would have made a meaningful difference in the lives of, of ordinary people. Now, of course, luckily, the story of urban change doesn't end with decline. Many of our older, colder cities have managed to turn themselves around. Boston, of course, being one of the providences we've been experiencing, ha has been going through a, a, a bit of its own renaissance. New York, of course, is nothing like it was during the 1970s. And, of course, Seattle. Right? It's so easy to forget. In 1971, two jokers put up a sign on the highway outside of Seattle with the letters, will the last person to leave Seattle please turn out the lights? Because Boeing had been cutting back on its jobs. And no one could imagine a future for Seattle without Boeing. It would be like Detroit without General Motors. Clearly, the city was through. Of course, this was before Amazon, before Microsoft, before Costco, and Starbucks was at most the whiff of an aroma in a coffee blender's nostrils, right? Uh, a city that completely remade itself over the last 40 years, not because of a people mover, not because of any, any specific uh, structural policies, but because of smart people and entrepreneurs causing the city to come about and have on a totally different cast. Now, if you ask yourself what variable separates the Bostons from the Buffaloes, the Seattles from St. Louis, it's education. Above all, if you look at the older, colder cities of this country, the share of the population with, co with a college degree, whether or not that is in 1980 or 1970 or 1940, the presence of a land-grant college prior to 1940, enormously strong predictor of subsequent success. Boston's land-grant college, of course, is MIT. Um, uh, and even things like the number of Congregationalists per capita in 1850, which predict education in the 20th century, do a reasonably good job of predicting more recent success. This is the relationship between population growth across counties, dividing them into fifths on the basis of the share of the population with a college degree. Growth rates are, of course, three times higher in our more educated counties relative to our least educated counties. This is the relationship between per capita GDP and area-level education across our metropolitan areas. And indeed, the correlation between area education and unemployment was enormously strong during the recent recession. Now, this is not just an issue that richer people, that more educated people generally earn more. Having educated neighbors makes you wealthier as well. On average, holding your years of schooling constant, as the share of the people in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your wages go up by 8% on average, holding your years of schooling constant. It pays to have skilled neighbors. And this is even more true in the developing world. This is the relationship between national GDP and mass scores across countries in the world. And as you can see, there's something of a, of a fit. Now, the fact that comebacks, that urban comebacks, have happened disproportionately in skilled industries, idea-intensive sectors, in knowledge-intensive areas like finance. There's a reason why finance is so often an anchor in our urban cores. It's because there's no other industry in which having the latest tidbit of knowledge is worth more money. These are the areas which, above all, are willing to pay for the advantages of proximity. The comeback of our skilled cities, of our idea-intensive sectors, reflects, explains the paradox with which I started this talk. 
the reason why cities have come back, and especially skilled cities have come back, is that what globalization and new technologies have done is they've increased the returns to being smart. They've increased the returns to skill, to human capital. And there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of studies that have documented this everywhere in the world in every which way possible. Now, we are a social species. We get smart by hanging around other smart people, and that's what cities enable to happen. We come out of the womb with this remarkable ability to pick up information from our parents, from our peers, from our siblings, even occasionally from our teachers. Right? Cities make this, make this possible. Right? If you think about, if you think about it, it, what industry, above all industries, should be good at doing long-distance working? It should be computers, right? It should be high technology. And yet, what do they do? They cluster in Silicon Valley. Which company? should be able to do long distance work better than Google. And what do they do? They build the Googleplex so they're all on top of each other. Right? This is what cities, what cities do. Uh, in some sense, um, the, the, you know, the, the remarkable thing about cities can be illustrated by a trading floor. Trading floor, right? Here, they, here you have some of the wealthiest people on the planet when a normal industry would sit behind great oaken desks and in, in protected by large offices. But they're on a trading floor. Here are all these rich guys. And they're right on top of each other. They're sweating on each other. They're getting guacamole on each other. It's all a mess. Right? They're foregoing all the perquisites of privacy that their wealth should enable them to have because knowledge is so important in that industry. And that, in some sense, is the city writ small. They're there because knowledge is more important than space. And that's what cities have enabled us to... That's why cities have come back. Because all of this change the new technologies, the globalization, which have increased the returns to coming up with a new idea because you can sell it on the other side of the planet, because you can source it on the other side of the planet. That's made it more important to be innovative, and that's been made it more important to be around and close to smart people. And also, of course, as um, ideas have become more complicated, it's become easier to lose those ideas in translation. And face-to-face -face contact is the best way I know of to communicate a complicated idea. Anyone who has ever taught knows the hard thing about teaching is not knowing your script, it's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through. <laughs> we have evolved over millions of years to have these wonderful cues for communicating comprehension or confusion. And those cues are lost when we're not in the same room. That's why face-to-face -face contact remains so relevant in the age of the, of the Internet, and why cities are not going to go away. Now, uh, in terms of predicting urban success, school-taught skills are fine, but surely the most important skills are those that are learned on the street afterwards. And it's hard for me to think of anything that is more important than the skills and the inclination to be an entrepreneur. Sixty years ago, the economist Ben Chinitz compared New York and Pittsburgh and was noticing that New York appeared to be more resilient even then. And he claimed, he suggested, and there's been a lot of re subsequent research that has supported him, that the gap reflects New York's industrial legacy and the entrepreneurship that it inculcated. New York's great industry, as I've already suggested, was the garment sector, an industry in which anybody with a couple of sewing machines and a good idea could get started, as indeed thousands of immigrant entrepreneurs did in, did in New York, often branching out to do other things, like A.E. Lefcourt, whose story I tell in my book, who built more skyscrapers than any other New Yorker did in the 1920s. New York, Pittsburgh, by contrast, because of its legacy of, of coal and, and mines, had U.S. Steel, a vast vertically integrated company, great at chaining company men, right? Great at training an organization that made steel available throughout the world, solving logistics problems. But those guys, when things changed in steel, they would have not the foggiest idea of what else to do, what new industry to go into. They were trained to be part of one vast organization. Not the garment sector guys. They could adjust. And that's what we've seen throughout the world, that places that have lots of small, nimble firms are able to adjust, are able to find new ways, while places that lar with large firms do not. This is one of the, our you know, many measures of entrepreneurship, which is just average establishment size. Those places that have the largest average establishments have growth rates over the 1977 to 2000, uh, 2007 period uh, that are three times, three times the, the smallest firms are three times higher growth rates than, than the largest firms. Just far more dynamic places. Now, the most entrepreneurial place I've ever been in the world is the Dharavi slum of Mumbai. Just an amazing place. In one store, there, there are a couple of guys who are sewing brassiers, and you think you're in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1905. And then a little bit further on, there's a ceramics cluster where they're making these beautiful little pots, and they're so proud of them, they won't even take your money uh, for them. They give, you, give one to them. And then across the street, there, there are people sitting on the floor recycling plastics. And you hope that those syringes, that something's being done before they're actually being recycled. Uh, and then you go a little bit further down, and there are guys who are coiling wires to be, to be used. And then there are guys who are recycling boxes by chopping them up and turning them out so you can't see the, the signs. Just an amazing hub of activity. And you just feel the future of India being made there. And then you go out in the street and there's a kid defecating in the street. 
and the streets aren't paved and the water isn't clean. And it reminds you that there are tremendous demons that also dwell in dense places. That in fact, if two people are close enough to give each other an idea face to face, they're also close enough to give each other a contagious disease. And if someone's close enough to sell you a newspaper, they're also close enough to pick your pocket. And cities for thousands of years have been battling the downsides of density. And this remains the great challenge of the cities of the developing world, where there is no future in rural poverty. But at the same point, to create a more livable world in India and sub-Saharan Africa and China, we need to do a better job of solving those urban challenges. And they are enormously hard, as our own history tells us. A boy born in New York City in 1900 could expect to live seven years less than the national average. Today, life expectancy in New York and many of our successful cities is actually three years higher than the national average. No one quite understands why older people have lower death rates in New York than younger people. Some people credit social connection. Other people credit walking. Among younger people, the relative health advantages of cities are, well, are really quite easy to see. Two big factors account for the mortality differences. Motor vehicle accidents, a huge one among young people. It's just a lot safer to use public transportation as you've been having a few drinks. It's the only health tip I'm going to give you during this entire talk. Uh, the, second, the second thing is, of course, suicides are much lower in cities. That's in itself something of a puzzle. Perhaps it reflects social connection. But another explanation is, is that is the relative absence of guns from ordinary households in urban areas relative to rural areas in the country. And hunting licenses per capita are a very strong predictor of teen suicide rates across counties in the United States. Um, now, this didn't happen by accident. Our cities only became healthy through massive investments in infrastructure. Our cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. And we took many wrong steps getting to that answer. One of them was done by these two characters, two of America's founding fathers. This is Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Burr, of course, would later shoot Hamilton on the shores of the Hudson. But before Burr shot Hamilton, he hired him to be his lawyer. Um, and Burr had a scheme. See, they, there was only one bank really operating in New York at this, at this time. It was actually Hamilton's bank. And Burr wanted his own bank. But he couldn't get a, ba a bank charter on its own. He he had a clever scheme to wrap it up with a water company. Now, New York knew it needed better water. The yellow fever epidemics of the 1790s seemed to have made the case clear that they needed a better water supply. So Burr said, you know, give me a, give me a water company, but subsidize it with the ability to run a, run a bank. Hamilton, using words that would be recognizable today, made the case to his Federalist buddies on the New York City Council that having public water provision would lead to burthensome taxes. That's, that's an exact quote. They agreed with him and gave Burr his, uh, his private water, water company. Now, anyone who has studied any, any economics knows that it is an idiotic idea to try and subsidize uh, relatively low-returning, highly socially valuable activity by giving the entity in question the ability to do some entirely different, incredibly lucrative activity as a sideline. Of course, what happened was exactly what economic theory would predict, which is this company did a lot of banking and very, very little water provision. And of course, it's still with us. There it is. It's J.P. Morgan Chase, which was the Chase Manhattan Bank, which was the bank of the Manhattan Water Company. It is a lie, uh, what Wikipedia tells you, which is not, not unknown, uh, that this octagon is the cross-section of a water pipe. That is, in fact, not correct. But it may help you, in fact, remember the origins of, of the Chase Manhattan Bank. And, of course, New York did not get clean water until it invested massive amounts in the Croton Aqueduct. Now, some urban problems require massive investments, engineering solutions like the Croton Aqueduct. Others require intelligence. Others require interventions that actually change behavior. There's, in fact, no way to build our way out of traffic congestion because there's something called the fundamental law of highway congestion, which is that vehicle miles traveled increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. If you build it, they will drive, right? And you just can't keep on building lanes and expect traffic to get any better. You actually have to stop giving people access to roads for free. You actually need to charge people for using a, a scarce resource, valuable lives. Um, Singapore has had, had congestion pricing and now electronic road pricing since 1975. It is the second densest country on the planet. And its roads move swiftly throughout the day because people are charged for the social costs of their actions. Okay? London has had similar, if not as remarkable, uh, changes to its own traffic since charging people as well. Now, of course, if cities do invest, if they are able to conquer the demons of crime and congestion, and contagious disease, they can be places of tremendous pleasure as well as places of tremendous economic productivity. Of course, we see this around us in Providence as well. Cities are places for people to come and live, and that's been a remarkable change. Think about the rise of reverse commuting, something very, very rare in the 1970s, which is quite common today because cities aren't fun, because the same entrepreneurship and competition that makes cities a great place to have a software cluster also makes cities a great place to have a thriving restaurant culture. 
the division of labor that Adam Smith told us thrived in cities means that we have lots of different restaurants in, in urban areas serving tons of different cuisines, whereas in low-density areas you end up eating something called continental cuisine, and you leave yourself asking, what is this continent from which these people come, and how could I avoid going there? Um, and, of course, they allow fixed-cost fixed, fixed cost things like the Opera House in Sydney. Now, one of the problems that our cities have had over the past 30 years is that some of them, the most successful ones, have responded to demand by making it more difficult to build. The declining line shows the number of new permits in Manhattan. The rising line shows rising prices. Just as New York became more attractive, dealt with its crime problem, had an economic resurgence built on finance, it became more and more difficult to build there. There's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. Okay? If an area becomes increasingly attractive and you don't build more housing, it becomes unaffordable. A boutique town that only the wealthy may, may afford to live in. Okay? This is actually what Jane Jacobs got wrong. There's so much wisdom in Jane Jacobs' work. Uh, that she's, a, she's an ongoing inspiration to all of us who, who dabble in cities. But she looked at old buildings and new buildings, and she noted the old buildings were cheap and new buildings were expensive, which led her to conclude that the way to preserve affordability was to make sure that no one built any new buildings on top of old buildings. That's not how supply and demand works. If you have demand and you don't allow density to go up, right, you risk building an area that is affordable only to the wealthy. You need look no further than her own Greenwich Village Historic Preservation District that she herself worked so hard to create, okay, where a neighborhood that was affordable to middle-income people like herself and her husband in the, in the 1950s and now is a place where townhouses start at $5 million a pop and hedge fund managers only need apply to see what happens when we follow these things to their natural extreme. Now, I am the son of an architectural historian. I believe that our, our older buildings are treasures every bit as precious as anything hanging in the Louvre. But there are trade-offs, and it's not that by you know, freezing whole neighborhoods in amber, you are not preserving affordability. You are doing the opposite. It may be worthwhile doing. Bruges is worthwhile protecting no matter how expensive Bruges gets. But there are trade-offs in our thriving cities. We should not be museum museums. They should be, in fact, places that continue to change. I'm going to skip over this. Prices are higher in places that allow prices, – prices have grown, grown less in places that allow more building. Um, Mumbai is incredibly restrictive, and this is a tragedy for India. And I want to end with a, with a story, though, about why it is so important for us to rethink our policies towards cities. And these policies do involve some of our most successful cities allowing there to be more building, becoming less restrictive. Boston is one of those places that could allow more building. It involves rethinking our federal policies that violently subsidize home ownership, but home ownership means living in a suburban home, not an urban apartment overwhelmingly. Right? More than 85% of single-family detached houses are owner-occupied. More than 85% of multifamily units are, are rented. When you're going to have a national fetish for home ownership, and I am a homeowner, I want to make this clear, you're going to be pushing people out of urban apartments into suburban homes. You do the same thing with subsidizing the highways, and of course, the most tragic problem that we have for our cities are our schools, and hopefully we'll talk more about that in, in, the, in the area. But one reason that we need to rethink this is that, in fact, if you think there are any issues, potentially, with energy use and climate change, that, in fact, cities are much more of a solution than of a problem. And I want to illustrate this with a story about a young Harvard grad, college graduate who, in a beautiful spring day in 1844, went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord. And he went to do a little fishing. The fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain, rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a chowder, this is New England, right, after all, uh, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass, and a fire started, and it spread. And soon it was an inferno, burning down more than 300 acres of prime wood, and the whole ecosystem destroyed. During his own day, this young man was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The conquered freeman called him a flibberty gibbet, which I think was pretty bad for 1844. And indeed, it's hard not to think that they were right. What resident of, of Boston or Cambridge did as much damage to the environment as this, as this young man did? Of course, today, somewhat oddly, he is revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. He is, of course, Henry David Thoreau, whose book Walden tells what a wonderful thing it is for us to live surrounded by trees in, in, the midst of, uh, in the midst of nature. But his own book appears to tell us an entirely different story, right? His own, his own life tells us that we're a destructive species. And if you love nature, the best thing to do is to stay away from it, as indeed Thoreau would have done nature a great deal of good if he had stayed at home in Boston or Cambridge instead of going out cooking chowders in the middle of the forest. <laughs> now, indeed, there is a modern scientific version of this. Together with Matthew Kahn, a UCLA environmental economist, we, I have measured carbon emissions for a standardized household fixed in terms of house, household size and income across different parts of the country. 
there are unsurprisingly very big differences between people even holding income and family size constant who live in dense urban areas and typically drive far shorter distances and live, typically live in smaller housing units. The greener areas have lower, uh, have lower carbon emissions. The red areas where both Thoreau was and indeed where I lived, I also moved to a suburb when I started acquiring small children about six years ago. Um, only economists talk about acquiring small children. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and I watched my own carbon emissions soar uh, as, uh, as I did so. Uh, I make no pretensions towards sainthood. I want to make that clear. Um, we have a living closer together is, is indeed a way in which we can, in fact, take care of the environment rather than, um, rather than harming it. Now, the reason why this matters is we've also done similar stuff to, for China. Is if the great growing cities of China and India see their per capita carbon emissions rise to the level seen in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 130 percent. If they stop at the level seen in wealthy but hyper-dense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30 percent. It's a huge difference. Now, I don't is America, right? So I don't know if you actually believe in global warming or you're just worried about the price of gas at the pump. Either one is okay, right? In either case, you have a lot to be gained by China and India building up rather than sprawling out, right? And I think that's a reason why, that's yet another reason why we as Americans shouldn't stop treating our cities as ugly stepchildren and embrace them as being the place where America flourishes and finds its, its true genius. Thank you very much. two of us, imagine yourselves at a bar and <laughs> overhearing a conversation between two guys just hanging out. And uh, the thing is that Mark is so good at making and, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to have to be very careful not to say things, but I don't at least want to be on the record. So I, can't, <laughs> I can't actually. Uh, oh, good. Want some water? No, I'm okay. And uh, so imagine you're just kind of hanging out and we're hanging out at a bar and you're with us. Can you hear everybody all right back then? Everybody okay? And then we're going to throw it open to all the people that were eavesdropping at the bar. Thank you. Thank you. That was That's wonderful. Great. Thank you. Great. <laughs> nice job. That was great. What are we going to do with the fact that the wealthier, wealthier are getting wealthier and the poor are getting poorer? How do we actually create these large infrastructural uh, projects when there's an agenda operative throughout the world to uh, reduce the amount of money that's being spent on infrastructural projects and uh, lowering the tax rate for those who are wealthy? Well, uh, there, there are a bunch of different questions that are rolled, rolled up in this. So first of all, on inequality, I think by far the most important step that we need to take on inequality is, is involves human capital, involves education, because improving skills are the most sustainable long way, long run way we have ensuring a more equal, open uh, society where there will be more mobility. And indeed, the great shame of the cities in our age is not the corruption that Lincoln Stevens talked about, but it is city school systems. And that is not a, a, an indictment of the people who teach in those school systems or the people who run those school systems. They face enormous problems, enormous challenges uh, that make things, things very, very hard. And uh, it is remarkable how many talented people have worked in these fields over the past 20, 30, 30 years I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I couldn't be a bigger fan of Joel Klein, for example, in, in, in New York and the energy and the brilliance that he brought to his job. And yet, with all of his tremendous work, he moved the needle just slightly. Um, but it is the great challenge, and it's a challenge that is a challenge from the perspective of the health of the cities. It's a challenge from the perspective of inequality and what to do about it, because I, I think if, if the other way to handle inequality is to redistribute income once you're, at, once you're already an adult, to take, to take more money from the rich and give it to the poor. Regardless of what thinks, one thinks of that, it's hard to imagine that America is ever going to acquire an appetite for doing that politically, right? <laughs> Whereas schools are still saleable because people do still see the fundamental justice of making sure that every child should have, a, have an opportunity going forward. And also, of course, it's about the strength of our country. It's about the, the economic future of our country will be determined far more by the skills that are in our children's heads than by, than by anything else. And I think that really is the great agenda. And it always, you know, it always feels tragic to me at every national election, every time we waste a chance to talk about how it is that we're going to make sure that every child in every community in this country has, has a, a great school that they can go to. Now, there was a second part of that, so let me pivot from that to infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, if anything, I think we spend too much money on highways and not enough on schools. To begin with, let me just, let me just stipulate that. I do think certainly there are infrastructure projects that, that we do need to have happen. Many of them can and should be funded by user fees, and we should often have more of a pro-user-free oriented approach to development. I fault uh, the president 
for making highways. The Republican uh, 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 convention actually attacked him for, for not doing enough for highways, which I find somewhat strange during the thing. I fault him, of course, in the other direction. I, I was unhappy that there was that you know so much of the direct government spending went on went on highways during the uh, during the stimulus package, um, and I. I deeply unhappy about the recent highway bill that was passed in, in June as well, particularly because it has totally abandoned any pretense of paying for highways with gas taxes, which are an imperfect m means of getting a user fee in there, but still at least something that suggests that drivers should pay for the cost of their infrastructure. The idea that we're going to do it with general tax revenues, which seems to be the new equilibrium, is just seems absolutely tragic to me. I think the right policy is one in which we try to figure out investments in infrastructure. Often that should be, you know, we should return to the presumption that localities are, are typically going to be better at doing that themselves rather than thinking that it's going to be flowed from the government and they should be paid for typically by users. And we should certainly be focused on maintenance. I think one of the most helpful roles the federal government could be doing is specifically measuring road quality, measuring road safety, and then using financial incentives to ensure that the maintenance is being invested in because that is something that, that actually the federal government can do and that local leaders often, often pay too little attention to. But, for instance, the airline industry is greatly subsidized, or the trains that really cross the United States and, and made for huge amounts of, of, uh, in, of building throughout the country, and then later a lot of the land rights were used by oil companies. All of that stuff didn't depend on user fees. That was actual conscious investment, consciously deciding that this is what we need in order to boost an economy and make people rich as, as well. You know, one way to think about this is that the transportation investments in the 19th century had such a large return because they were starting at such a low base. Remember that it was as costly to move goods 30 miles over land as it was to ship them across the Atlantic Ocean. We're a pretty connected country right now, and there are certainly tremendous failings to our infrastructure, but it is very unlikely, and we've seen very little evidence, that transportation investments have reached anywhere near the same level of returns that they did when we, start, when we were sitting at the Conestoga wagon at the Conestoga wagon stage. So not to say there aren't good, useful transportation investments to be made. I'm not in any sense trying to say this. But it's significantly, I think, less transformative for the country than investing in the skills that are in our, our children's minds. I do think the right answer to, transfer, to subsidies to other forms of, of, you know, I think in general you want to get rid of most of these, most of these subsidies. To the extent to which these subsidies are about connectivity for poor citizens, I'm, I'm in favor of that, but at least we need to be smart about it and make sure that it's being directed in a way that has a meaningful, has a meaningful thing. But to give you just a clear example, I think it's absolutely straightforward on, on user fees and, and transportation infrastructure. Take JFK Airport, right? This is frequently given. You take right? they, they, I don't they, want to have any part. Right, of we, we want to go back to New York. <laughs> think about. I mean, JFK Airport is often given as a poster child of what's wrong with American infrastructure relative to you know the glories of being in Hong Kong or some other place. Now, I'm all for that. I want JFK to be, be better. But this is a sign of you know political failure. It's not a sign that the Fed should be paying for this. There's no reason why the well-heeled travelers who are coming in and out of JFK should not be paying for their own darn airport. Right? That these are the people who should be paying to have an elegant airport. It shouldn't be taxpayers in Des Moines who are taxed to pay for wealthy travelers going in and out of JFK. And the more that you have a presumption of this, the more that you can actually raise the traveler fees and actually build a world-class world -class airport paid for by the people who actually will use it. No, I, I certainly am not referring just simply to transportation. I'm referring to more to general support for education. I'm referring to support for... Uh, um, subsidizing beginnings of businesses, the way businesses have traditionally depended on government subsidies in order to reach, to go from an incubation stage into a stage where they can hire people. I'm, and I agree with you that the United States doesn't seem at this point to have the, uh, the uh, psychological wherewithal to uh, tax the wealthy to the extent to which you would really need to do in order to renew the uh, economic, the educational, the ecological vitality of the country. Educationally, I don't think it's a very big issue. I don't think it requires a lot of thought. I travel a lot to international schools. I see a lot of private schools. It's no, it's, it's, it's no coincidence that these kids go to schools with 12, 15 kids in a class with huge amounts of uh, uh, land to travel on, that these kids are happy to go to school. The education, however it's done in this country, is still problemed by the lack of, of economic resources. It's true. I mean, it needs, it needs so many things, and it, it's, such a, it's such a huge issue facing our, facing our future. And we do need to be focused on being, being smart about this. An, another lens to cast on this, which is that, you know, I, I, as, as you mentioned, I direct a, a center for state and local government. And I, I always, you know, I'm a big fan of state and local government. And, and I think that state and local government is filled by people who are working really hard to make their communities better off. And I'm frequently less of a fan of Washington, D.C. And, and often I cast dispersions on both sides of the political aisle, as I tend not to be particularly happy with, with, with either of them. But I'm least happy by the fact that it devolves into partisan sniping on ideological issues that are so far from the fairly nuts and bolts problem of actually how do we get our schools better? 
How do we actually make sure that our businesses have the best economic environment that they can have? Now, once you go down to the state and local level, that partisanship becomes much less strong, much less severe. Mm -hmm. There's a very nice paper by a co-author of mine and friend, uh, Joe Jerko, with his co-author, Fernando Ferrero, that looks at how city policies differ, whether or not they have a Republican or Democrat. And the way you test this is you compare places that are right above winning having a Dem and right above winning having a Rep, so the 49, 51 thing. So it's really like it's a natural experiment. No difference whatsoever, as you would expect, right? Did you remember Mike Bloomberg was re elected as a, as a Republican and that Tom Menino was elected as a Democrat? They don't differ in any mm -hmm. meaningful way, except for perhaps Bloomberg is more state interventionist on the on the on certain, certain on sodas uh, on sodas. Yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, I should mention I'm a, I'm a columnist for Bloomberg View, which uh, you can either take this financial conflict of interest disclosure or the fact that I'm advertising. Either way is fine is fine with me. Um, but uh, it doesn't make it because there's not a Republican or Democratic way to, to you know clean the streets. There are core city services that need to be delivered, and they have budgets that they need to make, and that is healthy, and that is good, and that, that means that mayors throughout the country have been focused on how is it that they make their schools better off. They haven't entirely figured out how to do this. They still do face resource, resource problems that are enormous, and the most important resource is actually the human capital of the teachers. Uh, but they, they are at least focused on those core issues, and that's, that, that tends to make me a very strong localist in terms of, in terms of uh, where I see the, the future is coming from. And the feds have a, have a helpful role. Race to the top was a very helpful proposal. I mean, it, it did, in fact, push for change in terms of schooling. So there are, there are things the feds could, could really do, but I think the driving entrepreneurship tends to come from the bottom, the bottom up in government as well as in, as well as in private industry. Mm -hmm. How do you keep cities and, and the, the globe itself diverse. And I, by diverse, I don't mean something like, oh, we want to give everybody a chance, or that it would, I just mean color or nationality. I mean diversity of all kinds. It seems like as an ecological uh, 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 law, diversity is healthy. If there's a way somehow of convincing people of the idea that investment in the opportunities for every people to show their intelligence would be a good thing for all, or that an uh, investment in the healthcare system would be healthy for everybody. It seems like approaching it not from a, quote, charity point of view, but from a sustainability point of view is the way to approach it. And I don't see that operating anymore. It's usually two paradigms. One is a free market paradigm, the other is a liberal paradigm. Liberalism, it seems, doesn't get to the idea that we all depend on each other. I think that's right. And, and the, the, you know, I've, I've always felt case for education, there is unquestionably an inequality reason to be in favor of better education. Mm -hmm. But if you're selling it, sell it as being about national strength. Mm -hmm. remind, remind people that, in fact, this country's strength depends, you know, stands or falls on the knowledge that is in our children's, our children's heads. And if you, you know, if you get distracted from that, we will be a, a country that is much less than the country that we are, that we are now. Um, and, you know, if, if you were asking me which I thought was more crucial for America's, America's success mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s, I would choose the GI Bill over the highway, mm -hmm. the highway spending any day of the week. The, uh, yeah, yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, so I remember it, that's what happens with the brain, we saw too many things at once. Um, you know, I understand what you're saying about the rural poverty, but I also understand that there are uh, World Bank, and uh, international agencies which have actually brought about certain kinds of conditions in rural uh, economies that are degrading a lot of that life. And I wonder if this is not, in the same way that the city's clearing out of industry was a conscious decision by, in New York City, the New York Regional Plan, which made choices to say that we don't want to take this valuable real estate land and use it for industrialism. We want to take it out and use it to sort of, I mean, for lack of a better term, gentrification. But there are governmental and, and, and globalized forces at work financially that are making choices to degrade the uh, different environments and to upgrade other environments. You know, I mean, I would have said, and I, again, just keep on naming words, I, I keep on I keep on having to disclose things. I'm also a World Bank fellow. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, I some of my best friends are World Bank fellows. Uh, it's really which means okay. I have no actual, you know, serious association with them. But I am, I am co-authoring a book uh, that's uh, uh, with, with someone, or I'm co-editing a book with someone, someone in the World Bank. Um, look, the bank has made many mistakes over the over the past decades. Certainly, um, I would, I would actually have said that on net they've been, you know. Too pro rural rather than too pro urban. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have I would have taken that view, but clearly I'm I'm inclined to take that view. Um, uh, most of the people, because most of developing people who you know 
most developing people live in rural areas. They've been focused on rural development. And some of those investments have been very, very productive. We've done amazing things in terms of agricultural productivity over the past, the past 60 years. Um, but um, certainly mistakes have been made on both, on both sides of the, the coin. And you know, it's, it's always a process of constantly you know, yeah. figuring things out. And the one crime is to not to, you know, we all make mistakes. The crime is not to learn from them. Yeah, I don't mean to, to target uh, the World Bank. No, I mean simply to say that there I'm are... I'm actually happy to. I, mean, I, just, I, just, I just feel <laughs> like I have to disclose before the... Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm more interested in the idea, for instance, large dam projects that are being put into the Indian, uh, into, into very strongly rural, traditionally rural areas, will, which will destroy the, the social and economic infrastructure of that society, are also, in some ways or another, destroying certain wisdoms and certain ways in which people have lived over the centuries, which might be as valuable as some of the plant life, which has later shown valuable, va uh, to be valuable for medicine. To be clear, a lot of dam projects are actually rural development, not urban development. Right. right? So, so this but, is but the one in India is it's specifically helping the ones you're thinking about is, is helping a, a uh, you know, un unquestionably every every form of infrastructure needs serious cost benefit analysis that right. is as holistic as possible yeah. in terms of thinking, thinking yeah. through these things. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only thing I, I think about that I wouldn't I wouldn't I worry about not recognizing what there is in rural societies and not doing what we can to, to actually make that balance something that the society itself has to, uh, decides to you do. Know, I couldn't agree with, with that more. And, and I think the key point, remember, I mean, I, I, the framework of The Economist is that, you know, we cherish individual choice, right? We cherish freedom. And that doesn't, that isn't inherently anti-regulatory, but the goal is to actually give people the options to make. And that is as true as to about where they live as about anything else. I think it is an incredibly good thing about America that people can choose to live in suburbs or exurbs or rural areas or urban high rises. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful thing that people have different choices that they can make. Mm -hmm. The last thing I would ever be suggesting is that there's sort of one thing that you should be doing. What I think the government's role is is to charge people for the social costs of their actions or to regulate in some way that internalizes the fact that there are activities which cause, which cause harm to third parties. And beyond that, by and large, to, to let, you know, not to get it, have its hand on the scale. And I think over the past 60 years, we have had our hand on the scale against cities. And I think that is, that is a big mistake, because cities are as precious as they are. But it's not as if I'm saying that everyone should live in a city. And as I've already said, I, I'm <laughs> currently living in a, in a suburb. Uh, and, you know, people make choices, and that's, that's what they should be doing. I live in Wakefield, Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anywhere near a city. <laughs> but I grew up in New York, as you did. <laughs> um, so... How are we going to fix Providence? <laughs> <laughs> well, you seem to be doing a pretty good job. I think it, so, uh, too. As, yeah. uh, without any of my, my intervention. Ooh. I think a couple, of, a couple of key things, right? So Providence does have these anchors of educational institutions that are very, very helpful. It's part of the very healthy Boston, you know, greater Boston ecosystem that's great. There has been a focus on arts and creativity. That's a great thing. Cities are very, very good at that. A lot of the investments in redevelopment appear to be quite intelligently done. This, this stuff is very careful. It's not large-scale arenas. It's sort of small-scale, mm -hmm. sensible, sensitive, sensitive stuff that I, that I think is, is you know, very, very appealing. And it's all taking place on a very human scale that respects the way that cities, cities work. I mean, you talk about the sort, of, mm -hmm. the sort of wisdom of rural communities. There also is, of course, a wisdom of urban life, which is, in mm -hmm. fact, what Jane Jacobs was best at in terms of, in terms of chronically. And it seems to me that as I look about Rhode Island see what's, mm -hmm. see what's been done, it seems to me that it respected that, and certainly that's, that's the way forward. Now, you know, the recession hit Rhode Island, hit Providence very, very hard. I mean, the unemployment numbers were staggering to, to many of us. Uh, uh, this is, a, of course, you know, it's, a huge, it's a huge setback. I, I suspect it's something that, it, with the wisdom of 10 to 15 years of hindsight, it will look like it was a temporary aberration rather than a change in long-run trend. But certainly it makes things harder for the, for the short run, mm -hmm. uh, not just in terms of the economic dislocation, but also the difficulty of taking, taking public steps in when you're facing such extreme economic I think we've been lucky enough here to have a relationship between state, private business, and arts organizations to create the kind of uh, uh, synergy that you're talking about. There's been a, a, a some sort of minor subsidization to arts and cultural institutions, which have grown enormously because of it. And because of that, other people have been attracted to, and smaller incubated businesses have begun to evolve out of that. We have an area right now, and most of us know about it, the area uh, where 195 used to be. I love referring it that way, because we always talk about everything that way, when this used to be here and this used to be here. My wife Vera wants to have a, one of those um, 
Magellan systems that's built to be like Rhode Island. So make a left where the bank building used to be and make a right turn. But it's under where 195 was. The 195 was a swath of highway, basically, part of the, basically the Eisenhower system that was moved. In the process of being moved, it freed up a lot of area, some of which was once called the Jewelry District, which was a site of a lot of old jewelry factories and became a site of very precious and, 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 and long-loved uh, bars and, and clubs. And now more of that area has been opened up, and there's a process of trying to reimagine that area. Do you have any history of looking at similar kinds of areas in other cities and have noticed what they've done successfully or unsuccessfully? Well, I think the, you know, this is, this is I mean, experiments like this happen all the time. And I'll take, I'll give you two contrasting approaches. Um, think about the, the, in both, both, I have connections with both of these things. So, um, one of which is the Innovation District in Boston. It's Boston, it's the, it's inevitably going to be, have a fairly heavy hand of the Boston Redevelopment Authority in it which is not necessarily a bad thing, but the VRA has a vision. It's a vision that starts with physical infrastructure, and they're sort of imagining the space and then sort of trying to fill in the, the people moving in. Opposite side of the coin, and a very novel approach on this, Tony Shea, Zappos, Las Vegas. Okay? Shea moved his, moved his headquarters from the, from the uh, suburb into the central city, taking up the old city hall. Bought a swath of land down there and is trying to redevelop it as an arts area connected to this, connected to the new Zappos, Zappos headquarters. They're putting people, as opposed to sort of building world class buildings for aspiring entrepreneurs in the innovation district, they're putting people in shipping containers. Shipping containers. The shops are going into shipping containers, right? Because it's temporary, because they don't know how things are going to develop, because they're letting the hmm. ground up entrepreneurs try stuff and see what, what works and then move it, move it around. Both approaches can work, mm. but I certainly see, and look, the Boston thing is in some sense likely to work because it is prime real estate in a very, in a very successful metropolitan area. I mean, it, it's, in the, it's on the darn water, for goodness sakes. It's right next to the <laughs> contemporary art and the, and the yeah. convention district. This is an area which if this fails, you know, <laughs> they, will have, they will have screwed up, screwed up <laughs> massively, and I think it's not likely to. And it's reasonable to plan for success. The Vegas property is not exactly in the highest end area of Las Vegas by, a stretch of, by any stretch of the imagination. It needs to be experimental. It needs to see what works. It needs to not lay down infrastructure first and let it evolve. Think about where you fit on that spectrum, because obviously it's a continuum from actually wh whether or not you're going to lay down the, the physical space immediately and say this is where we are, or you're going to do things that feel temporary that allow for gradual accretion and experimentation. The less sure that you are of where this thing is going to end up, mm -hmm. the more it pushes you towards temporary structures. This is particularly true, by the way, in the developing world. If, unless things are wildly wrong in India or China, any housing they build for people now is going to be wildly inappropriate for people in 40 years. Mm -hmm. As such, they should always build things that they expect to be obsolete very, very shortly. The more that you expect this thing to be a, be a district that is, you know, that is an uncertain future, not uncertain in the sense that it's good or bad, but uncertain in the sense that you don't know exactly what's going to evolve in, be cautious about what things you're going to lay down and allow the experimentation to go up, go go along for time. Good. I'm going to. Uh, is it okay to open sure. it up for sure. some questions? Sure. <clears throat> uh, I will take this here. And good, huh? Even after a softball injury. <laughs> um, anybody want to ask questions, please? Hi, my name is Shauna Pearson. I'm a political science professor at URI. Um, thank you for coming. Something you said about education that really touched, um, touched on one of my biggest frustrations with the discussion about education and urbanicity. So I wanted to bring it up as um, something to talk about, which is we talk about the strengths of cities and the problem of education without really talking about the constraints. And that constraint is for any political scientists in the room, federalism which is we talk all about the federal government and how they should be doing more for education, but the fact of the matter is the vast majority of paying for education is placed on the cities or on the local governments. And so you have probably the suburb you live in and the suburb that I grew up in, which has no education problem at all. And then you have Providence, which I'm, I'm sorry to anybody who loves the mayor in here, and I have no problem with him either, but he came into a fiscal constraint and fired every teacher in the system. Great way to keep good teachers and inspire parents to keep their kids in the school system. So you have a set of conditions where we as a country say we should be investing in schools, we should be investing in education. 
but we leave that investment to local governments and state governments who right now are facing incredible constraints and who are deciding we're going to leave more to the local governments to pay. And the first time in, I think it's 70 years, in this recession, we've seen a decrease in education funding. So while I think that everybody in the room can agree that what's facing the cities, what's facing rural areas, what's facing the country is a problem economically as education, we don't talk about what really has to be done to increase the prospects of impoverished Americans for um, gaining those educational opportunities. And one of those biggest things is breaking down the walls between the suburbs and the cities. I, I actually agree with that. I, I think actually federalism is a curse in this, in this area. Um, and it's, um, you know, I, I make the argument in my book that America would be served by either a switch to the, you know, switch to the, the extreme right or the extreme left on this, on this. <laughs> and I'll, I'll explain what I mean in a second on that. Um, uh, but it is unquestionably true that our local schooling system, time-honored, has ended up being an absolute disaster. It's been a disaster both in terms of the quality of education that's being delivered and, because, and the inequality of education. And it's, it's, it's unbelievably tragic. The only thing I would push back slightly on is the, and this was much more of an idea that was popular in the 70s and 80s, and it, it elicited a whole bunch of school finance equalization schemes that were, by and large, fairly unsuccessful. That the problem is not just money and equality of spending. Our highest spending schooling districts in, in Greater Boston are not the fancy suburbs that are doing well. They are, in fact, the central city. They, they are, in fact, the central city districts that have, um, you know, typically a very, very strong school finance equalization problems. Very, fairly fi strong school financial equalization support. The problem, of course, is that educating someone who comes from an elite background with parents that are constantly invested, overly invested in making sure the kid knows everything they could possibly know about everything is just a totally different problem than educating someone from a much less advantaged background. It's not spending the same amount of money on the two doesn't deliver anything in terms of, in terms of equalization. I'm not saying that you, you were saying that, but I think it's a, a mistake to be focused too much on the money of this because, in fact, financial equalization does, does, does very, very little in terms of solving, uh, solving this problem. We need something that is much more radical. Now, when I say there are two potential schemes, um, you know, there is a state-sponsored scheme. I mean, there is a, there is a vision it's called a mythical place we call it France, right? And I'm not endorsing this, but there is a scheme that says, look, you know, it's Tuesday and it's 3 p.m. and I know what every third grader in the country is being educated in right now, right? Right now I know what's, I know what's being done. It's not literally true of what France is, but it is the old stereotype and it has a certain... Uh, it has a certain truth to it, and there is a way with very strong attempts to create national homogeneity and knowledge, a, a very strong national school system that you can create something that works. There's another scheme which says, look, what you want to do is you want to harness the urban edge of competition and entrepreneurship and have something that is far more charter-like, far more competitive, that also, uh, that also works. And you know, the countries that have done this, some of which are, you know, like Chile, are places that economists were given fairly, fairly... Uh, free reign. And there are problems with Chile's system, certainly, but it has the highest test scores in Latin America after 30 years of having, have, having voucher, voucher schools. And then, of course, there, is, there are places like the Netherlands and Sweden, which have also had their own forms of fairly strong school competition, where things, are actually, things actually also work quite well. And, of course, in the U.S., we have a very strong body of evidence now on those charters, and it's a biased sample because it's those charters which have lotteries. Okay, so then those charters that have lotteries are not all charters, right? The crappy charters don't get lotteries. And charters like are like startups in every industry. Some some restaurants are great, some some are fail, and some some are bad, and some fail. But the charter schools that actually do have lotteries, we now have a large number of studies comparing lottery winners with lottery losers, which is a very good methodology for comparing this and showing really big test score gains as a result. I mean, the impact of the Promise Academy in the Harlem Children's Zone on kids is just absolutely phenomenal if you compare the lottery winners versus the lottery losers. And it's no you know magic that they use. Mostly it's about longer class days. And the advantages of having longer class days go up the more troubled the background of the youth is because the gap between a school and not school is larger. Right? So it's not as if this stuff is magic, but it, it, does require, it does require effort, it does require work, it does require a different model. So we can go, we can go in either direction, but the current federalist system is, is a disaster. Hi, my name is Matt Boda. I'm also on the faculty at URI. Um, just, you talked a bit about user fees, and there's a certain amount of logic in that people who use, these, use highways, want to drive in congested areas, should pay user fees to discourage some of this behavior. But what about the fact that they seem essentially regressive, in a sense that you know, 
presumably people who have the means could easily afford the tolls to, to drive in the congested areas and people who, are, who don't uh, can't and, or, or people who have the means might actually be able to afford the higher priced real estates in the areas where they could be more easily be uh, walkable to uh, central uh, uh, cities. So, so the big champion of congestion pricing in the West is Ken Livingston, Ken Livingston, Mayor of London. Ken Sobrake, of course, is Red Ken Livingston. Red Ken Livingston is, needless to say, not a conservative. Uh, indeed, he was the bete noir of Margaret Thatcher for many years. The reason why he wanted congestion fees was because they taxed drivers into London, who were by and large wealthy, and the money could be used to pay for public transportation, which is indeed what he did for poor people. On top of it, the, public, the people who were taking the buses strongly benefited from the fact that there were fewer cars on the road. So I agree with you that there are pl times and places in which you can have this be regressive, but it doesn't need to be. And in fact, it often is exactly the, is exactly the opposite. Now, it is true that, that imposing user fees does make it difficult for poor people who are going to drive. There's no way of avoiding that. If you charge people for the social cost of their action, people have to pay for the prices. There are many ways of handling this. We can use the money to pay for services that directly benefit poor people, like the transport public transportation that Ken uh, decided to do. Heck, we could use it for something that may have larger returns, like investing in schools in, in poor areas or in after-school programs. We can do it in many ways that would fe feel like it, it counters it. But uh, we, yes, unquestionably, there are people with less income who are going to, some people are going to suffer as a result of this. But we can't let that stop us from doing something that is so clearly necessary in our most congested most congested areas. And if we don't do it, we're implicitly bribing people to drive longer distances, which doesn't make the foggiest bit of sense. Anybody else? All questions have been asked. Yes, please. Some people scoff at that and say, my God, that's just too much, too much money. It's not, it's not going to be that much of a, an advance in transportation. Others say it's worth it because it's going to spur a lot of economic development. And you can't view this just as a transportation investment. You have to view it as an investment in, in our economy. Uh, any thoughts about that? And we hear that there are streetcar systems in other mid-sized cities that have generated a lot of economic activity. So do you think it's a good or, or not so good investment for Providence to contemplate. Okay, I, I, I believe very strongly that every form of transportation infrastructure has to be taken on its own and needs its own very serious cost-benefit analysis. And as such, in no sense am I going to opine on a transportation investment, which I have in fact not done any cost-benefit analysis on and have not, have not looked on. That being said, um, uh, it, there, you know, if things like this can be done relatively inexpensively, it doesn't sound that inexpensive, but if it can be done relatively inexpensively, it may in fact generate some form of, of added benefits. But it is certainly true that the ability to make mistakes with large-scale transportation investments is uh, quite easy, a especially when the investment doesn't yield a lot of direct benefits and all the benefits allegedly come from some sort of indirect uh, uh, type of thing. Now, the question is if there was some way of, you know, some way of reaping the, the benefits of the thing through some form of tax increment financing so you can actually tie it in some clear way, then I, I think we're more, we're more open to it. Um, but I would feel more comfortable if the costs were being paid for by a private investor who then had some upside stake in the, in the benefits as well, so you actually had some sort of reality, reality check on it. But I think without looking at anything more, you know, more fine than that, I, I'm not going to venture a, a direct opinion on this one way, one way or the other. Yeah, you, you look like a man with lungs. Let's. Uh, the, uh... I want to get back into the, a little bit, just a little more pushback on the public education and that issue. Um, I'm sure that you all know that the Well, you shouldn't have put the lime in the coconut. <laughs> Or 
that we will not rest until every child in America has a great school open to them. That is the vision. That is the only, the only vision. Because it doesn't, you know, we need to be pragmatic. And most of all, we need to learn because we don't know how to deliver that vision right now. Okay? And that's why we're taking the scattershot approach, because we're trying to learn. And it's the right approach. When you don't know how to solve a thing, you actually try different things, you measure well, you, you randomize, and you find out what works. And I, I agree with you. It often feels as if there's a fad of the moment that comes in and comes out. But that is, sadly, how progress happens. And we are better served by this, this approach until we know what the right answer is than by saying, look, I'm going to you know, charge right in, and I know the large-scale intervention that I should impose everywhere in the world and, and do it. So uh, I wish that we were further along in this process. I find it agonizing that progress has been as slow as it, as it has been in terms of, of learning this stuff. But this is what knowledge looks like. And it's just going to be a long fight. Well, just one more thing, Frank. But the money follows. I mean, everything that's been happening so far is that there's been the, the hope is of an instant return and these incredible expectations. And then we shift to some other idea or whatever the flavor is of the month. Um, so to get the money to follow, I mean, there has to be some sort of vision, doesn't there? I mean, how do you know? Well, hold on. Let's. Let's be, let's be, I mean, American test scores have actually increased over the last 20 years uh, by a non-trivial amount. We, we have not, in fact, closed the gap with the global high performers, and there is something to be learned by actually seeing what they do. If you want to, there's a nice, uh, one of the, uh, there's a program that's affiliated with the Taubman Center, which I direct called the Program on Education Policy and Governance, that is a nice report looking at test score gains both across states in the union and uh, across countries in the world. And we have had improvements. Uh, but it's, we have not closed the gap with Singapore or, or um, South Korea. Um, there are substantial differences across the U.S. Massachusetts, Maryland, Florida are three of the national leaders in terms of the places that have the, had the largest test score gains. The places that have done the worst are actually the, the old Midwest, which is somewhat tragic because it's the, the birthplace of the American high school movement. So Iowa, for example, had a particularly bad 15 years in terms of test score, test score changes. There's evidence in all this as well. In terms, of, in terms of things that we, uh, we can learn. But we have, in fact, been making progress, but it is, it is slow. And we do, in fact, need a vision. But as I, as I said, I don't think the vision is that we have, you know, the vision is not all charters. It's not the right vision, because it's a stupid vision, because it gives up on the incredible infrastructure and the credible world of our public school systems. And technology is good, but it's unlikely that all this new technology is going to supplant the incredible power of a, t of a teacher and a student connecting with each other. We know that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is incredibly valuable. I would love that as a vision. That, that's a wonderful vision, that every student in America gets a fantastic one-on-one -on -one tutor. Unfortunately, uh, even I can't get myself around paying that, paying that check, which is just unbelievably, uh, unbelievably high. Um, so we have a bunch of things that work, but we're trying to solve a number of problems with, with all of them. And I think that's the right way to wage this, wage this war. But I don't know of a more important war, both for the country and for the children in our most disadvantaged areas and for our cities. I'll take two more questions. Uh, Jude and Steve. Um, hi. Why is it that um, Boston and uh, the proximity of Boston has a booming um, technology and innovative business thing going on? And Providence is 45 minutes away. We have a lower standard of living or cheaper housing. We have, you know, a wonderful cultural thing going on here in Providence. Why are we not able to attract these businesses that are so booming, so so close to us? It's a, it's a great question, and indeed, the reason why I mean I think the reason why Providence has a considerably brighter future than um, you know Akron or Detroit um, is, is that you are connected. You're part of this, you know, not just in Boston, of the whole Northeast Corridor, which is the economic heartland of this country. Um, the question is how can, and Providence has done you know, some of this. I mean, Fidelity, for example, which is part of this. Um, the, the question is how to make Providence, how to make Rhode Island more attractive in terms of a, a low and locale. And I agree with you. The low cost of, of living is a substantial plus. The other thing, though, to think about, which is really crucial, is how is it that you make your rules more business friendly, more startup friendly? And this, this can involve things like policies towards, um, and I know there was some work on this, I don't know the current place, part of policies towards um, uh, 
uh, non-compete clauses. So Boston, of course, is quite respectful of non-compete clauses. You can't start your own startup when you spin off some, from some other area. California is not, right? As a result, you know, it's, it's a low-hanging fruit, and I think we're done an action on this at some point in time, but it's low-hanging fruit to actually have, be as friendly towards, you know, guys who want to spin off from some company and, and start, your, start their new company here by not respecting any, any non-complete clauses signed in Massachusetts, for example. But there are lots of other things. You want to make sure your regulatory environment is a lot more pro-business than, than Massachusetts are. One of the big advantages that Rhode Island has is that you're a, you're a city state, right? You can actually change laws in a way that no, because you can operate on a state level, that no city in Massachusetts have. You have a freedom that Springfield and Worcester have, not just that you're cooler, uh, <laughs> as, as we've always heard. And I want to make it clear to my very dear friends in Worcester and Springfield that I by no means endorse the judgment <laughs> of the good gentleman from, from Rhode Island. Worcester is plenty cool. Uh, the, um, the Way uh, cool. Way cool. Wicked cool is, I believe, <laughs> the correct phrase. Uh, but the, um, um, the, the making sure that you have rules that are as attractive as possible is a way that I would be very focused on this. It's a mistake, of course, to, I mean, there's something that can be done with tax policy, but as was already emphasized, the problem with taxes is unless you really know how to cut out billions in waste, fraud, and abuse, and nobody ever really knows how to do this, reducing taxes means reducing services. And that's frequently a very bad trade-off because you actually, you know, you don't want a place that has low taxes just because it's a crappy place to live. Um, so you need to figure out a way to, to make things more attractive for startups, for small businesses that don't involve reducing service levels but do involve creating as much of a pro-business environment as possible. And most of our areas, all of, all of Massachusetts, is, is far, far more regulated than it needs to be in, in, lots, of key, in lots of key areas. And that's, that would be a good place to start. Steve? Wait, wait, wait. Let's mention it. Um, and, and we're absolutely not business friendly here. Um, but we're working on it. And we're not bad for startups, but we're, and we're getting better. Um, and we have great buildings, and we have you Brown do. University. You do? Those, those, are, those are big things. But I'm just curious about it from a, a national perspective. As a pretty solid second tier city and maybe third, I don't know, in a small state. But cities have balance sheets, too. They have the expenses and they have the revenue. And Providence currently has the second highest commercial property tax rate in the United States after Detroit. And we have, um, you, we can't cut our, you know, our expenses are cut to the bone. The, the, the schools are, are, so one of the qu things that's been big in Rhode Island is this problem around pensions. And I'm wondering if that is um, as crippling in the rest of the country as it, as it feels to be here. And, and the impact and how are we going to solve, is, is every city having and state having the same problem we're having because it's a third of our budget and, you know, it's just one of these things where until we can get these things under control, will we ever have enough money to fix? I mean, we, and we've moved railroad tracks, we've moved rivers. We've moved highways. We've we've done amazing things in the last 40 years in public in the public realm category, and you know, despite these things. But I'm just curious, from a national perspective, is it is this problem persistent across the country? Yes, yes, yes. It's it's, it's it varies more or less. Uh, it's bigger and smaller. But the the unfunded pension liability is a tremendous problem throughout our nation, and the tragedy of this this tendency, is that it's not actually good for workers either. Because, in fact, the way that we've structured what we've done with our public sector workers is we've structured their compensation overwhelmingly towards their latter decades. Now, that's not necessarily something that a young teacher or a young police officer wants. And, in fact, the reason we know this is that when young teachers, and there's a very nice paper by Maria Fitzgerald at Stanford that actually shows this, when you give teachers an ability to top up their pensions, so younger teachers, so at... 50 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar in terms of the actual value of the pensions that they're getting. Um, they turn it down. They'd rather have the money up front. So we have structured our compensation in a way that is very expensive over the long run, but does not actually yield value, does not actually, is not actually critical for actually attracting young, skilled teachers because it's not actually what, they, what, they, uh, what they're looking for. And many of them aren't actually looking for a 30-year career with government either. They're looking for a couple of years teaching, and then they want to go off and do something, something after. And often our pension systems do nothing for them. Um, so figuring out a way to move forward on pensions is absolutely critical. And it's clear why it happens, right? I mean, the cost of salaries 
are obvious. The cost of pension promises in the future are shrouded. Right? They're shrouded in ridiculous expectations of 9.5% compound growth rates of, of things, which no, you know, no private investor would promise, even in the most outrageous hedge fund. And yet this is the, the, you know, the mistaken math on which we are, this is built. And it ha creates a tremendous tendency to backload compensation. And we're paying the price for it now. One thing we should be doing is figuring out bargains right now where younger workers get more cash up front in, for, in exchange for foregoing future pension promises in the future, particularly in areas in which there's, I mean, you, want to, you, want to, you do want to be somewhat distinct about disability-related pensions, particularly in, among police and fire, where that's, a, that's much more of a real, a real risk. But um, figuring out a way to get more cash up front instead of those very large-scale obligations going, going forward. But it's an incredible challenge that we all of us are, all of us are facing. Um, I mean, it's an area in which I'm doing current research on, but it's not, it's certainly not one in which the politics are, are at all easy. All I can say is keep on talking about it, because the problem, the problem with pensions is that, you know, as my wife reminds me, whenever I write a Globe column on this, and you do remember there are no more, three more num mind-numbing words in the English language than unfunded pension liability. So much so that I've named it Nancy's Law after her. Uh, but, you know, the only, the only way to undo that is to continually shine a light on it, and that's, that's what's crucial. This wasn't a bad beer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm driving home. Massachusetts. <laughs> well, I, I really want to thank you for your generosity, obviously your intelligence, but your ability to hold contradictions and your ability to um, understand how to balance your ideals, your economic uh, um, uh, intelligence and your sense of history and I think that's not uh, that's rare and it's something I have to try to learn myself <laughs> but I appreciate all those qualities that you've exhibited tonight but especially the generosity that you showed as you came down to Rhode Island and helped us kick off what will be at least two more of these forums the next one being one on sense of place and how to develop and that will be uh, on October the 22nd but I hope you and I can continue this conversation over a real beer, and uh, with uh, nobody recording it. <laughs> Absolutely. Cat, <laughs> wonderful job creating this whole, uh, and everybody else who's been involved with it, the, from the food to the sound system to the uh, to the to technology to the conversation and to the friendships. I thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. And John, thank you.